office. What the fuck? <laughs> so, anyway, screw this. Please uh, um, welcome Andrew to the stage. Let me talk about offline rules. Thanks, Lenny. Um, so I work for um, the FT, which is a newspaper, and um, I think it's, it, I was really glad to see James and John um, talk about the, uh, the challenges that the web has posed over the last 20 years. Because for us, actually, distributing content to a mass audience is a problem that we've had for 125 years. We're actually celebrating the FT's 125th birthday next year. So right from the very start, um, the goal has been the same, write some original content um, that people want to read, that they can't get anywhere else, and then get as many people as possible to pay to read it. Um, so I think that our history can help us to understand where we want to go with our digital future, um, and the choices that we should make to try and create good digital solutions that will work and be long term. Um, so I want to start by showing you how we do print today. So this is a quick video showing you um, one of our print sites in East London. Now this machine is incredible. Um, every evening at 8 p.m. it starts printing about 600 pages a second. And by 6 o'clock the following morning, we have 150,000 copies of the FT already distributed across the UK. And this is a process that's repeated in 22 cities around the world. So, you look at a machine like this and you see elegance, complexity, but also simplicity. And every single part of this process is engineered and designed to do exactly what it's supposed to do, and it does it really well. I love these conveyors, that's brilliant. Someone's obviously had fun with that. Um, so this is like a technology that has effectively reached the pinnacle of its sophistication. There's not much we could do with this that would make it faster, cheaper, um, or obviously better. And so it's kind of depressing to think about where we are with HTML5 <laughs> and all of the hacks and workarounds that I'm about to show you that went into producing the FT web app. And sometimes you look at this print process and think, we're on the wrong side of the business here. But every revolution in technology goes through the, the standard kind of the Tuckman stages of group development, uh, forming, storming, norming, performing, and we've effectively, we're effectively in the primordial soup here of HTML5 when we compare it with what we've learned over 100 years of evolution of print. And the other thing about print is it actually provides a huge number of features. So if I have a newspaper, as a news reading experience, I get a lot out of that. It works offline. It's portable. It lasts for a long time, as long as you keep it dry. Um, <laughs> you can read it in bright sunlight. You know, it's cheap, it's ubiquitous. You can bookmark and share, albeit with scissors, but nevertheless. Um, and we can get really creative. You know, you can take a pen and, and circle stuff that you're interested in. You can write in the margins. You can pull the paper apart. When you're finished with it, you give it to someone else. All of this kind of stuff, you don't necessarily get immediately with a digital solution. So a couple of things there that I think we need to learn from print. And um, that second one really summed up in, in, in this phrase. We need to care about supporting our existing features as much as we do about getting shiny new ones. So with HTML5, our hope is that we can do that, that we can support existing stuff. We can allow people to get the same benefits that they've always got from a physical newspaper, and we can add in all that new stuff, like electronic delivery, search, personalization, that kind of thing. So the FT web app is our uh, first step on the road to that kind of ideal nirvana. Um, it's certainly not there yet, but we think it's a step in the right direction. We also, you may not uh, realize, uh, produce the Economist Group HTML5 app. Um, at the moment, it's only powering the Economist on BlackBerry Playbook. I'm sure everyone has a BlackBerry Playbook. <laughs> but, um, and I just saw the wrong so I'm terribly sorry for making that joke. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but nevertheless, it was our first device that we, we optimized for, so there's, there's something to that. 
So let's talk about the, the specific challenge of producing these kinds of things in a way that works offline. Um, and I'd like to um, refer back again to, to one of the talks we saw earlier on and about complexity and how um, over the last few years we've seen the growth of increasing numbers of tools and libraries and frameworks that offer layers of abstraction on top of web technologies. And when you start to introduce offline as a requirement, you find that some of these things that, that deal with best practices for things like dependency management, responsive images, analytics, login state, all kinds of stuff like that, don't work when you need them to work offline. So offline is a great example of a feature which um, comes into the web platform, and suddenly, if you've got a whole layer of tools and abstractions between you and the actual uh, the new technologies, you may find that you're not actually able to use them for some time. So offline makes everything harder. And the first thing you're going to need if you want to make your app work offline is some storage. You need to be able to store your data, your app, the application itself, and your application state in the browser. There are um, a number of technologies that allow you to do this. Um, and I'm going to introduce four of them. And they don't work terribly well together, and some of them don't work terribly well even on their own. Um, and I like to think of them as like a sort of dysfunctional family. So in my dysfunctional family, <coughs> we, have, we have cookies, which is like granddad, because he can't remember very much. <laughs> but what he does remember, he insists on telling absolutely everyone who will listen. <laughs> We have local storage, which is like dad, can't really multitask, um, good at remembering simple stuff, and knows exactly where he puts everything. <laughs> Index DB, like mum, good at complex relationships, structured data, um, can remember more stuff, and can be a bit slower at finding it. <laughs> but ultimately gets there in the end. Um, and finally, app cache, which is like the child that you're incredibly proud of, but you just wish they wouldn't be quite so annoying all of the time. <laughs> so we have to deal with this. And we have to deal not only with the technical challenges, but also legal issues as well. So most of us live in the EU, and we're starting to get extremely fed up with this kind of thing. And this is my favorite example of a cookie notice. It says, just in case you can't read that, you can read this or click to get rid of this annoying box and carry on as before, and the button says, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and what the Daily Mash have done there is they perfectly captured the user sentiment um, in relation to this, this message that they have to provide. And I'm very pleased to, to show you the Daily Mash one and not the FT one, which is awful. Um, I think we use about 100 words, and it's terrible. So this, you'll be familiar with this in relation to cookies. And in actual fact, the legislation that causes us all to do this stuff doesn't specifically mention cookies anywhere. So actually, there's a risk here that this kind of misguided legislation can affect our ability to do things with, offline, with any kind of offline storage technology. And that's quite worrying. But when we get past this, we realize that the problems go deeper than that into the technical implementation of these things and how they work together. So here's Firefox, for example. Let's assume I want to use App Cache and IndexedDB in my application, and I ask for access to both of them at the same time. Both require user consent. Apparently, Mozilla has two teams working on these technologies, and each one has decided to use a different UI to prompt for permission. More importantly, they've, they've decided to co cooperate only to this extent that they are using precisely the same text in their two messages. So it's actually not possible, even for a developer, unless you know the shape, to identify which one is app cache and which one is IndexedDB. <laughs> and from a user point of view, what does this mean? I mean, what happens if I click allow in one and deny in the other one? This is terrible, and we need to be, we need to be better than this. And then we look at the performance characteristics. And actually, when you start to uh, work out where you're going to put various bits of data, ideally, you would want to choose 
the technology that best matched the kind of data you want to store. So you put files in app cache, preferences in local storage, uh, documents in index DB. But that assumes that those technologies all have equivalent latency and equivalent capacity, and that's not true. So here's a test I did on JSPerf, um, storing and retrieving the word test um, as many times as I can in a second into each of these technologies. Local storage, 30,000 per second, index DB, around 300. So the difference is so stark, I've had to use a log scale on this graph to demonstrate it. So this kind of inequality basically uh, hamstrings development in the sense that it kind of forces you to use inappropriate technologies to the task simply because ultimately it will give you better performance. Now, despite all of this, we can store stuff in the browser using, this, uh, using these hooks, and um, we can get data there so that we can use it when we're offline. So when we're faced with an empty browser, some data in local storage, and a URL is typed in, we need to be able to create a page from nothing with no server connection. Um, so we need to talk about bootstrapping. Um, and how we can get that page to form in the browser from nothing. And now, the method that we used to do this is kind of inspired by how um, uh, uh, web pages came about in the first place. So in the early days of the web, you, you basically had a page that just had content on it. And that's good, because we didn't have very good internet connections, so it was worth having a page that was as small as possible. Couldn't make any money out of that, of course, so we added some advertising. This isn't the BBC. Um, and that's OK. But then we realized that we didn't have any links to our pages. We didn't have any links from our pages. We weren't getting very, very good search rankings. And people were disappearing from our pages after viewing one page. So we had to add some more content. <laughs> and at this point, we realized that 95% of our page is the same from one page to the next. And yet, um, and yet you know, we are reloading that the entire UI every single time. So we start to try and fix this by making our pages more interactive. Add extra content that's hidden that we, know we, can, we can enable when you interact with the page so we don't have to reload the page. And add all the libraries and frameworks that enable us to do that. And that obviously makes the page even bigger. So trying to fix this problem properly is also um, the solution to making our pages load offline. And that is to go back to basics. Serve just the content, or perhaps not even that empty body tags, possibly, um, and just serve a bootstrapper. That will enable us to um, assess the device, assess the user, work out what's appropriate for this user to see, and then our pages effectively become like sort of stem pages that we can morph into anything that we choose. So our pages become like front controllers that can route requests to any kind of content that we choose to create. And not just simply based on the content the user wants to view, but also based on the, pr the environmental parameters of the device and the user. So if we have a really big screen, we could pull in extra content and fill up the extra space, for example. So, and we can run only what we need. There's no point pulling modules into our page that enable us to respond to touch events if we're not on a device that has a touch-sensitive um, interface. And we can also use bootstrapping code to help uh, moderate some of the wilder influences of, of um, some of these offline storage technologies that we don't like very much. So this is effectively what it looks like. We end up with what we serve from the server, or possibly from the app cache if we're offline, is a very, very small amount of content. It's just the basic content at the page, um, some basic CSS to render that, and then bootstrap code. And that bootstrap code is where the magic happens, where we can decide what we ultimately want this page to be. And that can pull in extra JavaScript, extra CSS, extra HTML, either from the network or possibly from local storage or possibly from um, IndexedDB or App Cache. We'll have authentication tokens, which are coming from the cookies, and we'll have additional content, um, which is coming from IndexedDB. So we're using all of these storage technologies together to put together the page. And then once we've got to that page, we can then navigate to any part of our site that the user wants to get to without a further page reload. So effectively, you are bootstrapping the app experience on any URL. And that enables you to maintain the basic web principle of having a URL per resource. You know, we're a newspaper, we have, what, 10 million or so URLs. 
um, it's important that a user can get a permalink directly to the article that they want. So we'll serve that article, and then from then on, they won't need a page reload. So the initial page load for this is going to come from the app cache. And so I think it's worth spending some time talking about the app cache. In principle, app cache is quite simple. You write a list of files that you want to store offline, and this is called an app cache manifest. You link to that manifest from your HTML page. By linking to it, the browser will download it and will then download all the resources listed in it um, and will keep those uh, so that they can be served when the user's offline. There are a couple of special features. One is the fallback section, which says, if the user is offline, and requests a URL starting with this prefix, then serve this resource instead. And that solves our 10 million URLs problem. We can't list all of them in the app cache, but we can list one fallback that covers all of them. And then finally, the network section, which is the first gotcha of app cache development, because this lists all the URLs that you want to allow to access the network. So if you don't put any in there, then your app immediately becomes an offline-only app, um, which is probably not what you wanted. And here are some other gotchas. So the first one, and by far the biggest in my opinion, is that any page that you link to a manifest will itself get cached, even if you don't list it in the manifest. So if you've got your site with 10 million URLs and you link to your manifest from every page of your site, which seems to make sense because people can enter your site on any URL, every page of your site will gradually get pulled into the app cache as someone navigates through, through each page. And that seems bad, but it's nowhere near as bad as what happens when you realize that anything that's already in the cache will be used in preference to making a network request. So as soon as those pages are stuck in the cache, you will never get an update to them again. So the only way to deal with this is just don't put manifest attributes on your HTML tags. But if you don't do that, then how do you get your app cache populated? It's like a chicken and egg problem. So the solution to this um, at the moment is to, on every page of your site that isn't your home page, include your home page in a hidden iframe. <laughs> it's, um, it's a particularly elegant technique, um, and it does work. Um, other, other options are you could include a little kind of um, uh, a really short and sweet app cache loader type page in every page, including the home page. Um, but the benefit of doing this is that you then only need um, the one entry rather than two. So rather than loading both the home page and your app cache loader page, you need to load the home page anyway, so you may as well make that the thing that you put in the iframe. So the logic goes. Um, here's some other problems. And these relate to browsers that you may not initially be thinking of when you're building offline apps. So Internet Explorer is becoming important because of Windows 8 and tablets. Firefox is often a, a popular secondary browser on WebKit platforms. And both of these have odd behaviors when it comes to app cache. So Internet Explorer won't populate an app cache unless the manifest itself is ordinarily cacheable. And Firefox <laughs> won't store any resources in the cache if those resources are served with no cache headers, uh, no store directives in their cache control headers. <laughs> So we can deal with these things. In Internet Explorer, we can set a max age of one on the cache control header and put a private directive in, which means that only the browser will cache it and it won't get cached by any public proxies just in case we're making our manifest personal to each user. In Firefox, we can just avoid using the no store directive, which is relatively straightforward to avoid. Um, but there are more problems. So here's another one. When you update your manifest, every single entry in it will be re-downloaded. You can't simply say, add this file to the manifest, or add this file to the app cache, or remove this file from the app cache. All you can say is, refresh the app cache, and the browser will then re-download every single resource in it. And if it fails to download one of the resources, it will throw away all the ones that it successfully downloaded and revert to the previous version. So we can try and improve this with far future caching. So rather than listing simple URLs in your manifest, add a version query string to every resource and then serve those resources with uh, a far future uh, expiry date. So, you know, 10 years, 30 years. Basically, effectively storing it in the browser cache forever. And then when you want to serve a new one, just change the URL. 
And the result of this is that the app cache will still request every single file fresh, and it will discard all the current ones, but your browser still has the browser cache. So most of those requests will be satisfied from the browser cache and will repopulate the app cache from there. And this demonstrates another kind of weird complexity of app cache, which is that it doesn't replace the browser cache. It's entirely in addition to it. So it's completely possible for you to totally invalidate the app cache, refresh all the resources, but never actually make any network requests because all those um, requests immediately get satisfied by the browser cache. And the result is, in this case, we get what we want, which is we just refresh that one file. And here's the final thing. If we're on a slow network, so not a broken one, and not a good one, a request has to fail, has to time out before we can use a fallback. So the fallbacks are the ones where we have a prefix and we have a generic resource that is, we match to a particular <coughs> pattern. So if we go to an article URL and we're not in airplane mode, not completely broken, but maybe connected to a MiFi device that doesn't have a signal or on a Wi-Fi network that we haven't logged into yet so we can't actually access anything the device still thinks it's online, and it will try and make that connection, and it will need to time out. Um, and we don't have any control over how long that timeout is. So most users will give up before they get to that timeout point. And there's not much we can do about this. If you're Google and you have a browser as well as an application that needs this feature, then you can just implement it. Although in actual fact, I'm told that this feature landed before Docs um, tried to use it. But this is a, this is a spec for the intercept namespace in the manifest. And this is completely non-standard, but it effectively provides the facility to say, if the user attempts to, to go to a URL with this pattern, then immediately fall back to this resource without trying the network. But this is only present in Chrome, so you won't find it um, on any of the mobile platforms that you're targeting. Um, other approaches that we can take is we can try and push for change. Um, I'm one of the chairs of the uh, Fixing App Cache Community Group, and we're trying to collate use cases um, that will help to inform the spec process so that we can try and get App Cache um, to behave in a more useful way. So in the meantime, um, the kind of thing that we use App Cache for is fairly limited. We don't use it, for example, for CSS, HTML, or JavaScript. Um, what we do use it for is things that don't change very much. So fonts is a great, um, it's a great place to put fonts. Splash images sprites, the icon, um, our entry page, and our fallback. And those are the things we need in the app cache. Everything else, we can use much more uh, flexible, much more controllable storage through, through local storage. So talking of local storage and um, others, we ran out of space very, very quickly. Um, because actually, you don't get very much. And this varies enormously from one platform to another. But typically, and I, I, my, this particular test script that I ran crashed on Android, so I don't have that number. But um, effectively, you are quite limited in the total amount of data that you can store offline. So on iOS, for example, which is the most restrictive, um, on iOS 5.1, this is now increased in iOS 6, um, we can store no more than 65 megs in total across all the stores. And what's worse is that JavaScript um, stores text in these storage um, technologies using UTF-16 encoding, which means that if we write in English, and at the FT we write in English because we assume everyone speaks English and is wealthy, um, <laughs> you have two bytes per character. Um, and English, for the most part, is ASCII compatible, so it should only require one byte per character to store. Um, so effectively, you can imagine that you get half the amount of storage that you think you do. So we take an, an already pitiful amount of storage and we cut it in half. And that's terrible. It's kind of like, you know, seeing someone park like this. <laughs> and no one likes people who park like this. So we need to um, improve the situation. So fortunately, we can. It's a bit crazy, but what we do is we take our ASCII text. Uh, we first of all convert all our text to ASCII, so anything that's not ASCII will HTML encode. Um, and we then combine every pair of characters um, into a single UTF-16 character. Effectively, the bit stream is completely unchanged. We just convince the browser to remove half of the character boundaries by changing the character encoding. 
Um, and we've actually developed this to the extent that we now send data from the server to the client already in this format um, so that we can store it straight into storage without having to do the encoding on the client. And the effect of this is that rather than um, taking up 12, 12 bytes, uh, you now only need six bytes, which is the actual number of characters that you want to store. Brilliant. Um, sadly, in DevTools, uh, it looks something like that. <coughs> But you get half as much of this as you had text to start with, and that's the important thing. So, so here's one final point about connection state, or knowing whether you're online or not. Um, and this is quite important to you know, crafting a user experience that is going to be uh, as, as frustrationless as possible for the user. Because if we're offline, there are certain things that won't work. So knowing we're offline and being able to proactively not offer those facilities or those features to the user is a good thing. But unfortunately, this is not something which is easy uh, to know at all. And I gave some examples earlier on of, say, being, on a, um, being connected to a MiFi device that hasn't got a signal or being on a Wi-Fi network that you haven't logged into yet. There are lots of reasons why your device might think it's online when actually it isn't. And HTML5 tries to provide um, that data to us in the form of a, um, a JavaScript API called window.navigator.online. And I think this is amazing, that if it's true, that means that we might be online. <laughs> That's what the spec says. But, <laughs> but in reality, that is the best it can do, because you know, there are so many of these scenarios where uh, we don't actually know. We can't tell if there's some kind of upstream problem with the connection. So all we can say is that we might be online. But this points to some incredible bad, incredibly bad design in the, in the creation of this thing. I mean, for a start, who, who decided that online was two words? <laughs> online is, is one word, I think. Um, and secondly, you know, the correlation of the word true with might is, is <laughs> a little bizarre. So, I mean, I would have done window not navigated to offline, all lowercase is true when we know we're offline and, and false when we don't know. As it is, we have window not navigated to online, capital L, is true when we don't know and false when we know that we're offline. <laughs> so it's really a case of ensuring that we understand properly what we're actually being told and not try to infer um, additional confidence or additional data that doesn't actually exist. This kind of reminds me of this joke where there's some people going on a train to Scotland and they see a cow out of the window. And one of them says, oh look, all cows in Scotland are brown. And the other guy says, no, actually, there is at least one cow in Scotland, at least one side of which appears to be brown. <laughs> so tell what you know, not what you assume. Um, and we can evidence this in the Economist application where we have progress indicators um, when we're downloading our content. So when we're happily downloading stuff, we show um, a progress indicator that's steadily progressing across. When we stop receiving data for some reason, even if there's still, um, it, the, even if the browser still thinks we're online, is still returning true for window.navigator.online, we'll show an indeterminate bar um, indicating that there's some kind of problem, but we're still trying. You know, we got your back, we're still in it for you, we're still, um, we're still giving it a go. And then if it if it further times out, if we still don't receive any data for a further period, even if the browser still thinks it's online, we'll show this kind of gray, we've given up. But the two important things about this given up interface are, first of all, we show you where we got to, so that you have the confidence that we didn't lose what we had already downloaded, and that when we resume, we'll be able to resume from where we left off. And the second thing is we provide a button so that the user can tell us to try again. And that's really important, first of all, because it, it offers them a way out of the dead end. It doesn't feel like they've hit a complete dead end. And secondly, the user might actually have a better idea of whether we're online than the device does. So they can hit that button and prompt us to actually give them another go. So what have we learned and where have we got to? I look, on, I look back on all of those hacks and all of those workarounds that we have to implement, and I think, that's really depressing when you compare it to the elegance that we have in the print production process. But at the same time, it's 
doing this kind of stuff and discovering these kinds of problems, which enables us to push the web platform forward. So some examples from, you know, if you look a few years ago, you see uh, things like Comet technology, where we had horrible combinations of hacks with HTML files and iframes and, um, you know, uh, partially rendered script tags and all kinds of stuff to try and get data to be pushed to the browser. And now we have WebSockets, which solves that problem in a nice, elegant way. So this kind of stuff, once you've had the revolution, it evolves and it gradually gets better. And hopefully in two or three years' time, this talk will be completely redundant because all of this stuff will be really easy. And I look forward to that. Um, but in the meantime, we shouldn't like take refuge in native technologies, because if we do that, then we'll never solve these problems. And we need to solve these problems to push the web platform forward. So I'll leave you with a quote from uh, Mr. Tim Berners-Lee, who unsurprisingly is quite a fan of the web. And he said when I asked him, don't build native apps, build web apps. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>